Our next speaker this afternoon is Stanley Meyer of Grove City, Ohio. Stanley is a research and development engineer, and he has published one book called The Birth of New Technology, which is also the name of his presentation or the subject of his presentation today, The Birth of New Technology Using Water as Fuel. He has spoken at a number of different organizations, been on a number of radio and TV shows, and has publicly uh, distributed a lot of word about his work. So I don't want to take a lot of time further. If you can run your car on water, and if you're interested in that, that's why you're here today. That's the subject of his, his work. I will only ask him at some point to cover the question that everybody will want to ask, or most people will want to ask, and I know he's been asked it many, many times. You know, if your stuff really works, how come you're still alive? I've had that question asked to me already a dozen times or more, and I'll just ask it now so you won't have to come to the microphone and ask that question when it comes time for that. Nevertheless, I know you're going to be very interested and, and have a lot of fun listening to Stanley Meyer tell you about his work and research and development in using water as a fuel. Welcome, Stanley Meyer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to answer that question uh, very quickly, hopefully, when you go home tonight, I want you to look in the King James Version of the Bible and look up Job 38, verse 22 and 23. Back during the Arab and Bargo, I was affiliated in the retailing the truck parts, making over a million dollars uh, profit per year, actually 20 million across the United States. But my background is quite diversified from research development, product development engineering, and corporate entrepreneuring, starting corporations right on up into multi-international areas. So I found out that the Lord really had prepared me well over 20 years to be doing what I am doing today. And during the Aram embargo, when our truck stopped along the road, it became uh, uh, quite serious that if we had no way of starting the trucks and start moving goods and services in and around Columbus, Ohio, then within a relatively short period of time, the masses of people in the Columbus, Ohio area and across the United States will be facing a tremendous problem because the food supply chain in the United States is roughly around 27 days and the food supply chain in the world is less than that. And asking certain questions as to why we have an energy problem, I found out that something happened in this country that even the experts never really anticipated. And what actually took place was that the natural pressure in our existing oil fields start dropping at a fantastic alarming rate. So much, in fact, that we started importing foreign oil of around 5% and around 65. And by 1975, the President of the United States said that we must come up with an alternate energy source if we are to survive. We have not reversed that dependency on foreign oil. The Department of Energy, DOE, has admitted to the American people that we are now dependent well over 63% on foreign oil. If that oil is cut off to this country in any way, uh, shape, form, or fashion, in a relatively short period of time, this country could really be excited into war. You know, if you go hungry, then people start to try to do something about it. Sedan, for example, has access to the viral germ on a genetic restructuring that breathes of the bacteria of air and water and even of oil. And he has the Masada complex that if I go, maybe perhaps I'll allow the world to go too. If he would use that type of viral germ and contaminate the oil, one thimbleful could contaminate the entire oil supply of the Western world. If that would actually happen, then the countries of the world would be faced to stop the flow of oil to their countries to prevent perfection or, or infection uh, of that disease to the population of their countries. If that would actually happen, then we would be faced within 180 to 240 days of about 1.5 billion people facing starvation. For you see, the entire industrial revolution of the United States and the industrial base of the United States and the world is based on what? The supply and the utilization of energy. Now, back in 1965, I was in Washington, D.C. when the scientists were called in to come up with a fail-safe nuclear power system. And in three days in that meeting, I got up in a meeting, and unfortunately, I wasn't with the Lord at that time. And I said, gentlemen, everything you have said to me in this meeting is, is a bunch of BS. There's no substance on the face of the earth subject to uranium-238s or 235s that you're going to have the hourglass effect occur within less than a, roughly a 15-year period of time. Unfortunately, Three Mile Island came forth on the prophecy. We talk about Chernobyl, and in the 
Bible in the book of Revelation that talks about the wormwood in the end time. Wormwood, worm, wormwood would make the waters bitter and many would die. The Russian word Chernobyl means wormwood. It's a little bitter root plant that grows over in a certain valley in Russia where the Chernobyl plant is located. They talk about the radiation going out in the atmosphere and going over into the northern part of Sweden and Norway where they had to kill all the reindeer and all their animals. But they don't talk about the meltdown going down down in the water table and it's contaminating the water tables. And those contaminated water and radiation is now dumping into the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And all those millions of Europeans are using those waterways to wash their clothes and to wash their crops and so forth are going to be dying of cancer of high exposure to radiation. And it's said that millions will die as a result of Wormwood. We have a tremendous problem confronting it. It's the exact same thing that happened in the United States where its natural pressure started dropping. It's also occurring in the Arab fields. You can't keep continually taking the oil out of the ground and expect it's going to be there forever. And the pressure in the air fields now have been confirmed that they're dropping three times faster than it actually has occurred in the United States. Several years ago, I was, uh, it was confirmed, in fact, that the North Sea oil fields have dropped in pressure by one-third in one year, and those pressures are still continuously dropping. We have a tremendous problem on the hand that the nuclear, we hear about the greenhouse effect, the pollutions uh, affair. We're hearing about the nuclear, and we're also hearing about the depletion of oil. The entire industrial base of this world in the United States is based on the supply of utilization of energy. I went in my office laboratory and I said, God, you know I love my country. It's the greatest country in the world. If you'll help me put a power supply in the country, I'll do anything you want me to do. Subsequently, I was, the Lord revealed himself to me, subsequently filled with the Holy Spirit, and I've been exercising the power and authority of the Word of God in order to bring this technology in. The question that was asked, how am I still alive today? I've learned the power of angels. I went to the Lord once he started to show me the knowledge of how to use water as a fuel source. And I said, Lord, you know I'm not an ignorant man. The Arabs would knock me off, but let alone a string of other people have a certain edge on the energy market. And the Lord started showing me the power of angels. You know, in the Bible, one guardian angel destroyed 185,000 Assyrian troops. Imagine when Jonathan went up to the mountainside onto the plateau and says, Hey, Dad, the Lord took care of it. And he walked up, and the king walked up on the plateau and saw 100 hundred and some thousand Syrian troops dead, slain by an angel. One angel's killed all the firstborn in Egypt, and I have two of them walking with me at all times. One happens to be a foot bigger than I am, and he's got a chest on him like that, and I said, thank you, Lord, I need him. <laughs> you see, in a time, the Lord knew that, in fact, that we were going to reach a problem, a very critical state, that we were going to reach a point that we were going to have to do something and do it very quickly. And so my prayer was in desperation when I asked it, in my laboratory, in my office laboratory to help me. For you see, I, I have been confronted with high-tech development all my life. And I understand the processes of how to control and manipulate high technology to prevent them from coming in. Many of the horror stories that you hear about how to control high technology to prevent it from getting into the marketplace, unfortunately, is very true. I've been in high-level meetings and negotiations with leaders throughout the world because you see the same problems that are confronting us is the same problems that's confronting them. You know, in an interim period of time since the Industrial Revolution and since the time, the internal combustion engine is the greatest consumer of oxygen into the air. And core samples in the polar regions have shown that at that beginning of time, there was like 38% of oxygen in the air. It has dropped down to 21%. If you think we got a problem, in a mere interim period of 10 years, population will go from 5.4 billion to over 9 billion people, and the present rate of consumption and pollution and contaminants that we're putting in the air it's possible the oxygen content will drop down to around 17%. If that absolutely occurs, then we'll be on respirators. You see, I had to go to a source of power greater than Stan Myers in order to try to bring in this form of technology. And the Lord said that this knowledge that pertaining to water when he was talking to Job and he asked Job the question. He said, Job, have you ever considered the treasures of snow? Or have you ever considered the treasures of hell, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against battle and war? And the reason why I'm here today is that the multi-international corporate structure can't bring in this type of technology. The federal governments cannot bring in this technology. It has to come through an individual such as myself, and it has to move through you and I. So as I impart this technology onto you, then you have a responsibility to it. This technology must get in through the people, or otherwise it will not go forward. Go ahead. In starting my quest in order to bring in a power system, I knew from my prior scientific background that I must legalize the technology. 
If I do not legalize the technology and try to bring it out to the American people or even to the world, then in fact that technology could be blocked. It's not what Stan Meyer says that what we have. It's, it's already been proven under 35 U.S.C. 101, Section Patent Code and PF, under the PCT Treaty Act, show operability and we will issue the patents. When those patents are issued and you receive your gold seal and ribbon, it says that in fact you have complied the laws of the land and as a result of that now it gives me the ability under the Constitution of the United States to be able to bring this technology forward. Go ahead. In order to do this, we, we was contemplating how to use water as a fuel source since water is a fantastic source of hydrogen. In my laboratory, research laboratory back in Grove City, Ohio, I have the most scientific compilation study on the hydrogen that's ever come out of the scientific world through NASA. As you probably know, the Columbia Space Air Program is propelled by liquid hydrogen and li liquid oxygen. And in that report, it clearly stipulated that hydrogen was the most ideal fuel of the future. It can be utilized anywhere in the economy. It can even solve the environmental pollution problem. But they didn't have an answer in several major areas. One, to be able to produce the hydrogen on demand, release it economically, be able to control the rate of its production, be able to transport it without spark ignition. And I own and control all of this technology, both nationally and interna internationally. It's not the complicated processes that gets out into the marketplaces. There are processes that reverse to what we call the Cadillac idea that do not comply to the law of economics. And as a result, they do not get out in the marketplace. But solving the technology, the water fuel cell technology, using hydrogen fuel, using water as a fuel source, we had to develop it under the law of economics. The guy who comes up with the cheapest way is going to win out. That's the bottom line of any form of advanced high technology. The first question we had to ask was how can we be able to break or overcome the covalent link up of the unlike atoms of the water molecule. And so in scientific inquiry, you got to ask the right scientific question. And under the law of physics that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the question had to be asked as the Lord was directing me, what happens when the two unlike hydrogen atoms link up with the oxygen atom to form the water molecule? And what actually takes place is that when the oxygen atom accepts the negative charge electrons of the hydrogen atoms, an electrical imbalances occurs equal to the two shared electrons being accepted by the oxygen atom and therefore causes the oxygen atom to swing to a negative electrical charge because now we have only eight protons in reference to ten electrons and therefore the hydrogen atom now swings to a negative electrical charge. Since the hydrogen atom now is sharing its negative charge electron, the positive charge proton swings the hydrogen atom to a positive electrical charge. Therefore, the ele opposite electrical attraction force, Q and Q prime, between the two unlike atoms is now established once the water molecule is formed. The second scientific question was to ask, is it an electromagnetic field that is between the two unlike atoms? And the answer to that is no, that once, once the oxygen atom accepts the two negative charge hydrogen electrons, then the electrons pair together and therefore the oxygen atom does not take on an electromagnetic charge. So it became very obvious that we could comply with first, the first requirement of NASA to be able to pull apart the water molecule and do it in a very economical way. Go ahead. In order to do this, it became very obvious that all we had to do was expose the water molecules to opposite electrical voltage fields and shut off the flow of amps. 180 degrees out of phase, the electrolysis process. And once you shut off the flow of amps, we know in the law of physics that voltage, in fact, performs work. When you go home and you adjust the brightness control in your TV set or your computer monitor system, you're adjusting the voltage potential uh, behind the grid of the screen, which accelerates the negative charge electrons, which strikes the fluorescent materials, which in creates the greater light intensity. We know from the cyclotron, where it takes opposite electrical fields to accelerate particles, around a, a tube or a tunnel two or three miles in diameter and accelerate these particles close to speed of light and these particles hit a photographic plate and that's how physicists study matter. So we know in fact that voltage in, in fact does perform work but heretofore no one ever dreamed of using voltage to pull apart the water molecule in a physical manner. So using the opposite electrical attraction force would not now the positive charge hydrogen atom would it not be attracted to the negative charge voltage zone? You ever hear the law of physics opposite charges will what? and like charges will repel, would not now the negative charge oxygen and atom be attracted to the positive charge voltage zone? So therefore, we're now pulling apart the water molecule, changing the timeshare rate of the molecule and simply pulling it apart in a physical manner. Go ahead. In order to do this, we had to invent and develop the voltage intensifier circuit. 
Natural water, since it has the eight electrons in the L orbit of the molecule, does not like to exchange electrons. And as a result of that, natural water is a dielectric liquid, a value of around 74 or 78.54. And as a result of this, whenever you, pardon me, whenever you put a dielectric liquid between two electrical conductive plates, you electronic guys, what do you have? A capacitor, do you not? Now, when you put a coil in series to a capacitor on opposite side, you now have a pulse tuned circuit. And as you adjust the pulse frequency and you're tuning into the dielectric properties of water, amp flow goes down to minimum and voltage tries to take off towards infinity if the electronic components will allow it to happen. We're allowing using the electromagnetic fields of the two coils, of the resonant charging coils, to restrict the amp flow because you see electrons carry an electromagnetic field, and as a result, these fields around these two resonant charging choke opposes the move of the electrons. And as the voltage will now go through this coil 90 degrees opposite to current, and as a result, we now have a way to pull apart the water molecule in an economical way. By simply increasing the turns of the coils and by increasing the number of turns on the secondary, we now can increase hydrogen production still further by the applied, by increasing the applied voltage amplitude. Go ahead. If you know anything about electrical power, there are two parts to electrical power. One is that when you consume amp flow, you consume electrical power. Is that not so? Whenever you shut off the flow of amps and you allow voltage to take over, then voltage becomes potential energy, which now could perform work. Go ahead. As a result of this, we had found out some interesting operational modes heretofore was not in the prior state of the art of electrolysis. As you allow the voltage potential to increase, hydrogen gas production is now being produced on an exponential function, not on a linear function as to the prior state of the art. Go ahead. We also found out that under our uh, certification lab uh, laboratory testing that the electrical polarization process using voltage to pull apart the water molecule performs in all forms of natural water, even including the most purest form of distilled water. Go ahead. Here you're seeing where we are now sustaining and maintaining the hydrogen flame being sustained and maintained at a burn rate around 47 centimeters a second using ordinary natural water by sitting it, simply hitting the fuel cell with a very high pulse voltage frequency tuning into the dielectric properties of water. Go ahead. The flame that you see, the temperatures that we exceed from 5,000 up to 10 to 25,000 degrees by simply increasing the voltage potential to allow natural water to be used as a fuel source. Go ahead. It gave us the ability now to comply with the first major requirement of NASA, the ability to produce the hydrogen gas on demand. The blue zone signifies that as you release the hydrogen from water, it's a tremendous energy source. And under the National Bureau of Standards, it figures that the energy is being released is two and one half times that of gasoline. Now, many people do not know that when you run your car on gasoline and diesel fuel, do you not know that you're actually running on hydrogen? In a gallon of gasoline, you roughly have a half a pound of hydrogen to it. But you know natural water has 1.7 pounds of hydrogen to it? It is a tremendous, powerful fuel if you but have an answer to be able to release that hydrogen economically and do it on a controlled state. But as we release this energy now, we're releasing this tremendous amount of energy, we had to develop the blue zone, rendering hydrogen safer than that of natural gas. Now, in developing this technology, as I had mentioned, we had to develop it under the law of economics, that the guy who comes up with the, the least expensive way is going to win out. Anyone ever heard of the KISS method? Keep it simple, stupid, don't make it complicated. The technology had to be built out of a garage, a basement, a backyard. Why? To bypass any form of exotic manufacturing technology that can control you from bringing it into the marketplace. For an example, a chemist could develop a chemical that would increase the efficiency of a solar cell, but if Exxon had the patent rights on the wafers of the solar cell, which is owned by the Arabs, would that guy be able to get it out in the marketplace? But if I could develop this technology in the garage or the basement in the backyard, then I could block, prevent that type of a blockage from occurring. You know, the scripture says, don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. See, the Lord had prepared me very well in what to do in order to be very successful. In order to accomplish a task or retrofit, we had now to develop under the law of economics the ability to render hydrogen safer than natural gas. Now, these are very simple answers to a very complex problem. Back in 1975, there was no textbooks uh, on this technology, and that's the reason why I have been receiving the fastest patents in the United States history and also under the PCT Treaty Act throughout the entire world. Go ahead. 
One of the things we address with the natural water is like a sponge. It will absorb ambient air. What proves that out? Any of you gone fishing? You ever look at the gills of a fish? The gills of a fish does not change the molecular or the chemical structure of water. The only thing it does is agitates the water molecule to re release dissolved air. You know, in my ninth grade science class, I asked a question that when you light a match in the air, why does not the air burn up? Because the bulk of the air is composed of non-combustible gases like nitrogen that do not support the burning process. We had found out that the water fuel cell is a multi-gas generator. It not only releases the hydrogen and oxygen gases from water uh, uniformly based on the applied voltage potential, it also now releases the ambient air in a bulk of non-combustible gases or gases that do not support the burning process. And as a result, we now lower the burn rate of hydrogen gas from 325 centimeters a second around the 47 centimeters, 47 centimeters a second to co-equal that of natural gas. Go ahead. How do you run an internal combusted engine off this type of technology? Well, as an engineer, you look at the internal combustion engine in three ways. Number one, is it a mechanical drive device? to get us here today? Secondly, is it not an air pump? Will it not pump in the ambient air through the cylinder and shove it out the exhaust? Is it not also a manufacturer of non-combustible gases? That when the burning process, the gas combustion process occurs, it produces non-combustible gas that we meter back, meter mix back with the water fuel cell that we can automatically adjust the burn rate of the hydrogen gas to co-equal gasoline or diesel fuel or any form of fossil fuels. Go ahead. Now here we were sustaining flames of from 10 to 25,000 degrees, but if I will allow this technology to go into the kitchen in your home, your wife will come back and say, hubby, you didn't do too well. Look at my pots and pans, I got holes in them. How do you lower the burn rate of hydrogen gas to two or 300 degrees or less? You simply capture the gas that's going through the flame that producing the non-combustible gas and recycle back into the flame or into the generator. And as a result, you can regulate it and lower the flame temperature down. Go ahead. Now here's where I was filing the patents on the abilities to uh, render hydrogen safer than that of natural gas. And the United States government came back to me and said, boy, Stan, we know about styrometrics, but we sure don't know what you're talking about adjusting the burn rate of the hydrogen gas. You see, under the prior art, what they did was take hydrogen through an orifice, hit a hot plate, put energy into the hot plate, and then have the hydrogen end react with the ambient air, which in turn now would release energy from the hydrogen combustion with oxygen. The only problem being is the hydrogen moves three times faster than air and other gases, and so therefore you're expending energy in the process. But when we were supporting the flame, as you'll see on the videotape, once that flame is ignited, it stays there and it's maintained, much like that of natural gas or, or the fossil fuels. I said, well, gentlemen, if I show you how to do it, will I get my patents? Here's a flash tube. If I fill it up with hydrogen and ambient air gases and dilute it with non-combustible gases, or originally hydrogen and the oxygen or ambient air gases, when I ignite it, it would burn 325 centimeters in one second. If I fill the tube up with, with natural gas and ambient air, it burns around 42 centimeters a second. So it became very obvious that if I would dilute the hydrogen and ambient air gases with non-combustible gases that acts as a gas modulator, which slows the speed by which the oxygen unites with the hydrogen, I now have the ability to render hydrogen safer than that of natural gas. Go ahead. And as a result of this, we now have developed the ability so that we can adjust the hydrogen burn rate to co-equal any of the natural food, uh, fossil fuels like gasoline, natural gas, propane, and diesel fuel, or adjust it down to burning leaves or paper. Gentlemen, that was the number one major technology that gave us the abilities to retrofit the water fuel cell technology to any existing energy consuming device. You see, if the oil is cut off to us tomorrow, or if some other calamity will happen, the oil will not be able to get to us then we must be able to use a fuel cell that we can retrofit to industry very quickly to maintain it. We must be able to maintain transportation. Reports are coming out now that there's a possibility of, of deduction or a reduction in aviation fuel. So we don't have times and monies to develop new power plants capable of trying to maintain our economy if those oil is cut off. So we needed a retrofit te technology capable of doing this. And the ability to adjust the burn rate of hydrogen and gas to co-equal the fossil fuels now gave us the retrofit capabilities that we could attach it. Detroit in the car industries is not going to change over to a power plant when Stan Meyer shows you can take a $2.50 recycling tube in order to adjust the hydrogen burn rate to co-equal that of fossil fuels. Go ahead. This is another billion dollar patent. Prior art said the only way you can transport hydrogen gas was to cool it down to 465 degrees below zero, put it under pressure, and truck it down the road. And you've got to expend diesel fuel in order to do that. 
We simply take the ambient air, now mix it, meter mix it under a flame to produce the non-combustible gas, meter mix it with the hydrogen gas, and as a result, we can adjust the burn rate of hydrogen gas uh, less than that of natural gas, and we can run it through any conventional gas grid systems. These are major problems that have been solved to give us the abilities that we could switch over very quickly to water as a fuel source. Go ahead. This is another form of technology that uh, in the reports from NASA clearly stipulated they had no way of 100% uh, anti-sparkback device. We found out that when you feed the non-combustible gases or the multi-gases from water through a small little nar narrow passageway, we call it the quenching circuit, somewhere along the line the non-combustible gases separates the hydrogen and oxygen gases that prevents gas ignition. And as a result now we have an anti-sparkback device 100% irregardless of gas pressure or volume. Go ahead. It's developed what we call the quenching circuit. These are the quenching circuits here. This is the quenching disc. This is the luminol material. The non-combustible gas also modulates the control rate of the gas. So as a result, it allows this quenching disc to be cool. So not only have we been developing the technology to use water as fuel, but we also had to develop in a way to comply with all the federal safety, highway safety code regulations, or otherwise we would not be able to bring this type of technology out. This gives us the ability to come up with a 100% anti-sparkback uh, device. Go ahead. We've taken and elongated into a tube called a quenching tube that you can spark, ignite it, or burn it in any way, and it will not spark back into the generators. Go ahead. But you know, in the design criteria is to comply with the law of economics, we also had to design in a way that the same engineering design specification in one system would apply to all systems regardless of size. You see, during the Arab embargo, I happen to know then the fact that uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Navy Department, uh, since they had no fuel had to rely on nuclear power submarines at 60 percent of their submarines became inoperable in a very sh short period of time. Are you aware that in fact that during, the, during that period of time that our naval task force in the Atlantic Ocean could not move for over two and a half weeks so they had no fuel? You know at the particular time we only had two and a half days of aviation fuel to fight a global war or a global war of defense. Today it's down a, a day and a quarter and when it reaches a day the Joint Chiefs of Staff will have to make the decision no more global defense. If any of you people know about the war brokers, they are specialized people who bring nations into war. We're now leading into a condition that the pendulum can either swing to world peace or it will now swing it back into war. We needed abilities to be able to reduce the size weight down. We're increasing the voltage up. We're now adding laser energy in the process to be able to release it. We're now ionizing the, the gases in the water in such a way of liberating the electrons. And as a result, we are now attenuating and allowing a physical impact to be applied uh, across the electrical polarization process that gave us the abilities to produce higher gas yields and reduce the size weight of the system further. Go ahead. We found out some very interesting things that as you attenuate applied voltage in reference to pulse frequency, you hit resonance. And when you hit resonance, we had a quantum leap in the production of hydrogen gas. We also observed that as you hit resonance and allow the exaltation voltage for a period of time, let's say in this case five seconds, shut it off, we were producing gas for 94 seconds or divide five and in 94 we were producing gas 19 times in the prior offput stage than on the input stage. All of these characteristics were not of the prior state of the art. We found also that if you would leave the applied voltage together, hydrogen gas was being produced on a geometrical production uh, in, a, in a geometrical progression and would continue on until such time you reach the maximum flow rate of water into the resonant cavities. Go ahead. We also found out now as we allowed voltage to perform the work to split the molecule, uh, molecule. We went from the ra random to the polarization, the molecular elongation we talked about, to the liquid, the gas ionization. But we're also now going down to the atomic destabilization of the water molecule. You see, not only what good, for example, would develop the technology to put in a home as a home heating system, but if we could not get energy to the farmers. If the, armor, the farmer had no energy to be able to plow their fields and sow their crops and harvest their crops, do we eat? I was pulled in a closed door meeting in Columbus, Ohio, when the Columbia gas system informed us that our gas was being cut off 100%. You see, Ohio imports 95% of the natural gas into, into the state. I saw some of the richest, most powerful industrial leaders in the state of Ohio popping pills, and I thought they were going to have a heart attack, because what they told us was, was we had no energy. Go home and tell you two or 3,000 employees that you have no energy, therefore you've got to close the doors. If you have no energy, can you produce an item? If you can't produce a product, do you pay your bills? If you can't pay your bills, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. And that's why they were popping the pills and they were almost having heart attacks because they were showing that they were going out of business. 
and the entire industrial base of the state of Ohio was shutting down because we had no form of fuel. And they said, how in the world can you tell the average guy walking down the street what you just got to be saying to us today? No one in that room but one person had the answer to it. And when I went to the Lord, he had given me the answer. He said, Lord, we must move, and we must move quickly. And therefore, we also must protect the military and take it to the United States. Einstein said there's enough energy in one gallon of water that you could take a thousand-car train around the earth many, 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 many times. And the key was how do we go on with the development of the technology to get it in every segment of the economy as well as protect the military and take it to the United States. You see, in my lifetime, I learned that you must negotiate from a power of strength, not from weakness. Go ahead. We've now taken the liberated gases. We are now starting to expose it to a high voltage field, and we are now starting to bring the combustible gas atoms into a destabilized state. Now, in our technology, when you burn hydrogen and oxygen by itself, it's releasing that energy around two and a half times that of gasoline. But there's a tremendous amount of energy in water, and the key was how do you tap into it? Since uh, the hourglass effect of nuclear power plants showed us that if we don't reverse and stop using nuclear power, we're going to be faced with a tremendous health problem. We are finding out that we have no more fossil fuels. The Arabs can turn 180 degrees out of phase and sell the remaining oil to China. You see, China's just opened the doors to Western technology, have they not? 25% of the population of the world wants the same goods and services that you and I desire today. And it's put into tremendous demand on the, re on, the, on the remaining supply of oil that's within the world. If the Arabs would simply turn around and sell it to the Chinese, they could care less whether they sell it to the Western uh, countries or not. They're not very pleased that we had gone into the Mideast areas. So as a result, we're trying now to tap in. And scientists started going to the area of hydrogen fusion. You remember that? The Evermore Laboratory says, well, we'll take hydrogen and we'll compress it together under tremendous temperatures of 10 million degrees, under tremendous pressure, and put an electromagnetic bottle. Well, that's the example of the alchemist going over looking at his students and mixing up a concoction. And he goes over and says to him, he says, well, students, what are you doing? He says, well, we're trying to come up with a chemical to dissolve anything. So the alchemist says, well, students, when you find the answer, what are you going to keep it in? Well, Livermore Laboratory, when you find the answers, what are you going to keep it in? Well, I'm going to keep it in an electromagnetic bottle. I want to tell you what, if that electromagnetic field will oscillate uh, and fluctuate in any way, shape, form, or fashion, you've got a worse problem than three mile island I never dreamed of having. They did demonstrate hydrogen coal room, hydrogen infusion in the university. It's called the muon process. A muon was twice the size of an electron, and they would fake the hydrogen atom to accept the muon and eject its natural electron. And once the hydrogen would eject its natural electron, then the muon would decay, decreasing the mass of the atom. And therefore, all that energy that's held in the nucleus has to be released, because on the law of physics says everything must reach a stable state. I must stabilize, and as a result, releases the energy. They had proved this out many times in the university. But the technique, the muon technique, became a Cadillac process. It would take billions of dollars of trying to produce a, a muon generator. You see, the muon decays in a billionth of a second, so it became a Cadillac idea. We needed a way to be able to tap in to the atomic yield of hydrogen and do it very safely. So the Lord was dealing with me, and, the, and in the process, the answer was very simple. That as you ignite the hydrogen and oxygen gases, if you will now prevent the hydrogen and oxygen atom to come together to form the water molecule, it cannot stabilize, right? If the water molecule cannot form during thermal gas ignition, then what will happen? Well, thermal explosive energy has to keep continuing to occur until one or two states occur, either that a new atom structure is formed or an implosion effect occurs and mass is converted into pure energy. The equivalent energy yield from one gallon of water is more than 2.5 million barrels of oil per gallon of water when you're talking about tapping into the atomic yield of water safely. So as a result of this, we are now starting to destabilize the combustible gas atoms. We're starting to pluck off their electrons in the process to decrease mass. We're adding electrical or laser energy to the process to bring it to a high energy state. Now we've got combustible gas atoms coming off the water that is not in normal state. Right? They are now in subcritical state. Go ahead. To do this, we now had to develop the electron extraction circuit, the plucking the electrons, and you're now using the water as a source of the electrons as well as the gas. Now, as you uh, attenuate the pulse voltage potential, the negative charge electrons, in this particular case, would come out of the resonant cavity, come down here, interact with the filament of the light bulb, producing heat energy in the form of light energy. Now, you know what I, am I defining laws of physics? No. Now, what a byproduct of the process is electrical energy, gentlemen. When you look at water, you now have it as a source of electrons 
And when any time you move an electron down a source, uh, down a wire, have you not created electricity? Coulomb proved out that if you have a difference of potential of one volt, you can move one amp of current. Okay, go ahead. Now, in order to do this, we're now taking natural water. We're now mixing it with ionized ammonia gases and non-combustible gases to regulate the thermal uh, burn rate. And we're now subjecting it to a very high pulse voltage frequency, tuning in to the dielectric properties of the gas and now performing three functions simultaneously in order to release the energy from ordinary natural water on demand. Go ahead. Right here is an illustration of the hydrogen fracturing technology that as you hit with applied voltage uh, frequency, we're now plucking off their electrons. We are destabilizing the hydrogen and oxygen atoms by adding also the laser energy to the process. The ionized ammonia gases now are in uh, capturing and preventing the electrons from going back into the process. And as a result, we're now spark igniting it with the voltage. Go ahead. Now, this is an example of the hydrogen fracturing technology. To give it a little bit more of an illustration, here's where we plucked off the four electrons of the hydrogen atoms. We've highly energized it. So this is in a subcritical state, is it not? And as a result of this, we are now capturing the hydrogen electron. And as a result, uh, the laser energy being absorbed here now uh, is in a weakened state since the oxygen atom is in a, uh, in a high energized state. It will pluck off the electrons, much like that in muon, and release that tremendous amount of energy safely. Go ahead. Go on. Now we've also observed another phenomenon. We talk about ether energy, or God energy, or God's breath of energy. Uh, as you now subject the uh, liberated combustible gases to a high pulse voltage and restrict the amps, you're now attenuating the electrical fields within the atoms. In the law of physics, we know that there are four basic forces that affect the atoms. There's electrical force, electromagnetic force, weak and strong nuclear force. Is that not so? Therefore, applied high voltage will now affect and put electrical stress on the atoms. And as a result, we are now attenuating the energy aperture of those combustible gas atoms, allowing universal energy to come in the system. And as a result of this, we are now priming those combustible gas atoms to release a tremendous amount of energy. And as a result of this, we're using the voltage in order to accomplish the task. Go ahead. Here again, we're now using where the oxygen atom that has multiple uh, protons in its nucleus. We're now putting electrical stress on the energy aperture to allow the universal energy to come in. And based on the pulse frequency, applied pulse frequency across these combustible gas atoms, we are now bringing these combustible gas atoms to a very high energy state prior to gas ignition. Go ahead. Here's a dune buggy that's now being uh, developed. You'll see the dune buggy run on the water. This is going into pre-engineering stage. That happens to be the computer system has been developed in order to control the flow of water going into the system. This shows a steam resonator we talk about to prevent the water from freezing in the wintertime. That happens to be a gas processor. Uh, go on now. This is the systems now, systems approach that we're developing. This is the water tank. This happens to be the fluid mixing where we're now taking the ionized ambient air gases, mixing with the exhaust gases to control the burn rate. It's now going through a water metering device going into what we call a water fuel injector plug. Go ahead. This shows the electronic systems interfacing using uh, this is the water fuel management system. It's a computer system that now controls the water flow and the firing of the water fuel injectors. Go ahead. This system now is starting to be debugged and uh, it'll be now reduced down to IC circuit chips. Go ahead. This is another development we had. It's one thing to get the patents on the processing. It's a whole different ball game than when you get the patents on the processing, the way that you do something. But you also, in order to get the technology out, you must develop and have control of development rights on all the electronic circuit interfacing or the system's approach to the system. So we've had to go ahead and develop the, what we call a laser distributor that now allows us to activate the computer system to control the proper firing uh, of the water. Go ahead. This gives you an example of the water tank. As I mentioned, the gas processors, or this, that happens to be a steam resonator, heat the water, and that's uh, solid state uh, water level control. Go ahead. The technology has taken us now down to the size of a water fuel injector. In order to run your car in water, the only thing we need to do is replace your spark plugs. Hook it to a computer system, take a water tank, feed the water under pressure around 125 uh, pounds of pressure. 
The water is converted, goes through a resonant cavity, it's converted into thermal explosive energy on demand that occurs inside the engine. Furthermore, the design technology of the water fuel injector pushes out, the water pushes out any ambient air in the process, and as a result, when the water fills the resonant cavity, and it's now, uh, when high voltage uh, hits it, now converts it, liberates the gases from the water, ionizes it, and then goes into spark ignition, it has minimal amount of interaction with the ambient air, so therefore you knock down any form of nitrous oxide, which is minimal anyhow, to almost an absolutely negligible factor. So the water fuel injector now can fit into an, any internal combustion engine, as you see right here, and simply regulate the water flow in reference to the applied pulse voltage frequency electronically. Go ahead. You remember I had mentioned that the same engineering design, specification of one system would apply to all systems regardless of size. Did I not say that? Here's an example of the water fuel injectors as you see it that replaces your spark plug. Go ahead. Here's shown uh, in place in a, uh, a Volkswagen uh, engine, you'll see a dune buggy running on the water. Go ahead. This is the world's fastest Corvette. It broke the 271-mile-an-hour uh, speed record. We're taking the water fuel uh, injector technology, hooking it up to it, and uh, that's a seven-horsepower engine. We're now increasing it to uh, 1,000 horsepower because we can control the energy going into the engine, and as a result, we're going to try to break the world's uh, land record with that uh, car. Go ahead. This shows where we're hooking up to an Alaskan um, Bushmaster in order to break the aviation history and run it on water. Go ahead. This is where the injectors are now put into a tubular cylindrical arrangement in order to supply heat to the existing furnace or to a uh, steel mill. Go ahead. This is an example of the injectors now being retrofitted to an internal uh, a jet engine. Go ahead. This shows the jet commander. We're now retrofitting the technology too. Uh, we're going to try to break the record to go around the equator nonstop and turn it 90 degrees and go from north to south pole with it. So we're going to show demonstrations that we have, in fact, available viable answer to the energy problem used in water as fuel. Go ahead. This shows a closer example of the jet engine where all we do is replace the injectors in the jet engine and link it up to the computer systems, which now will control the uh, the production of the gas and the hydrogen fracturing technology. Go ahead. It shows a cluster array of uh, the rocket engines. Go ahead. Go ahead with the uh, videotape. Thank you. After the uh, videotape, we'll ha I'll open up for uh, questions and answers. How soon and how much? <laughs> All right, the average cost, it looks like, to retrofit to an existing car will be roughly around $1,500. It looks like around $3,500 for trucks. made an announcement today in Colorado Springs. He says he's come up with a device that will hook up to any engine and allow it to run on good old H2O. News 13's Kurt Goff tonight on the possible impact of the water fuel cell. Stanley Myers says the answer to dependence on foreign oil lies all around us in seawater, tap water, and rainwater. Any kind of H2O, he says, can power just about every type of engine. How? With the water fuel cell. It fits in the palm of his hand, but it could revolutionize the world. You're talking about a pollution-free, totally new source of energy, the voltage disassociation of water. The fuel cell converts water into a gas, hydrogen oxygen, which is released in the form of thermo-explosive energy. So the water fuel injector simply replaces the spark plug. We hook it to a hydrogen computer system, which regulates and meters the flow going into the injector. It processes the water in such a way to release its thermo-explosive energy and does the tubular array exciters or voltage zones are immersed in natural water, forming the water fuel cell. Once energized, the gases are quickly generated on demand, releasing the energy in the form of hydrogen gas that is two and a half times more powerful than gasoline. Once the fuel cell meets the energy demand, switch off the voltage zones, terminating the gas. You are now witnessing, in the truest scientific terminology, the ability of burning ordinary water under control means. The temperature produced exceeds 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The quenching circuit prevents anti-spark back while hydrogen gas is rendered safer than natural gas. Increased voltage on demand increases flame size, increases BTU capacity, 
The heat energy shown is two and a half times greater than that of gasoline and burns three times faster. Because of this, the gas energy can now be used to run your car on water. Channel 6, Columbus. This is Action 6 News, a 6 o'clock report with Tom Ryan and Gail Hogan substituting for Michelle Galeon, Larry Cosgrove with the weather, and Steve Minnick Sports. Let's get back on land to top our news here at 6 o'clock. An age-old dream becoming a reality. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. Water has always been considered a precious commodity, but Stan Meyer's invention may make it even more valuable. He has developed what's called a water fuel cell. It has taken the place of his old gas tank. The water fuel cell breaks down water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is used to run his dune buggy. And I don't care if you use rainwater, well water, city water, ocean water. If you don't have any fresh water, go ahead and use snow. If you don't have any snow available to you, then use salt water because there's no adverse effect to the fuel cell. Meyer started working on this project four years ago. He's not a scientist. He isn't even a chemist. In fact, he never graduated from college. Myers was determined, he says, to design something to protect this country from oil embargoes. And we have calculated that if we t take the dune buggy from Los Angeles to New York, we would roughly use 22 gallons of water. The Pentagon flew a lieutenant colonel in last week to look at Meyer's invention. There's talk of possibly using it in the Star Wars defense program and to run army tanks. Myers is currently perfecting a water fuel cell for cars. It will cost about $1,500. He says it won't need any maintenance and you won't have to replace it. It'll be at least two years before the fuel system goes into mass production. The day it happens will be one the fuel industry hates, but it'll put a smile on the face of those who've had to say at one time or another, fill her up. I'm Ralph Robin. Thank you. Uh, as you've seen in the uh, videotape, when I started back in 1975, I didn't have any white hair. Now, is there anyone here that uh, doesn't uh, believe that you're going to fight a lot of battles to bring it in? And we have fought a lot of battles to legalize the technology to bring in this, uh, to use water as fuel. I have over 25 major patents uh, already issued. There's 42, 42 major patents applied, 30 or 25 or 26 of them now have been allowed throughout the entire world. And as a result of this, it gives me the legal rights to bring out the technology. We are in the latter stage of the pre-engineering of the technology. Because of my engineering background, it gave me the abilities to take it and design it to get it to a point to get it into mass production. Uh, in the very next uh, ensuing months, going into July, hopefully, if there's no more stoppage or preventage or slowdown in our uh, attempt to get the technology in, 
then hopefully we'll have the dune buggy out under pre-engineering and also the uh, Alaskan Bushmaster. But you know, the reason why I'm here today is that we can invent and develop, as the Lord has shown me, to take this technology and to use water as a fuel to get it out to stabilize our economy. You see, we're all in the same boat, and if we don't do this, we're not going to eat. We're not going to tell about it, even in, in trying to cancel. Many people talk about all the problems that we have, and very few give the answers. But now I impart that the same responsibility the Lord has given unto me. He says, greatly I have given unto you, and greatly I expect in return. I have turned down over a billion dollars, cold cash, from our friendly neighborhood Arabs, never to do anything and stop on this technology. But the purpose is, you know, we pay out over $200 billion. We pay out over $200 billion to the Arabs for petrol oil to maintain our industrial base. They would pay $200 billion to keep this type of technology off. So now I've imparted this, tech, this responsibilities to you. The only way that we're going to bring it in, and history has shown time and time again, it's only going to come in through you and I. So I impart this responsibilities to you. We can invent and develop the technology. We can go through and fight all of our battles and our warfare and to win. But in the final analysis, it's going to come up to you. And you're going to have to make the decision whether or not you want this type of technology to come in and perhaps solve the environmental pollution problems, perhaps keep food on the table and keep industry alive and to be able to to help clean up the environment so that we can stay on this little planet, which we call the spaceship. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thank you. No? No, I am. Okay. I know you've got a question or two. Perhaps you missed a little something as he went by, a slide or two there. Uh, <laughs> If you didn't quite digest all of that, he is available. He's going to be around, going to offer a workshop. Our greatest enemy now is time yes. and the clock, and his time is up. But he is available, and you know he does. He is.